God, come to my assistance. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Good evening, everyone. Very glad to be here uh, to join together in this experience of Lectio Divina. Um, we have, I've been doing this for about uh, 16 years now. Uh, first of all, when I was in Edmonton, and now that I'm the Archbishop of Toronto. And I do it every month. Uh, first of all, uh, the evening prayer or Vespers, because I think that's a great tradition. We used to do it more and more, and I'd love to have that in every parish. This singing of the psalms, the great songs to God. And it's very beautiful the way it can be done. And that after Vespers, after we sing the psalms, then a little bit of Lectio Divina. Now, Lectio Divina means divine reading. And it's an ancient tradition of the church. It is a way of approaching the sacred scriptures. Now, sometimes we simply read the scriptures from cover to cover, which is good, although it sometimes gets difficult when you get about 10 chapters into Genesis and you start having long lists of names and things like that. But it's good to have a sense of the whole book, certainly to read a book of scripture. And our Holy Father, Pope Francis, has recommended that we keep with us um, a little book of the Gospels or maybe a New Testament. And when we have a little bit of free time, pull it out and read a little bit of sacred scripture. A second way in which we read the scriptures is really in many ways the most important one, and that's at Mass, when we proclaim the Word of God. It's especially important because that's where much of the New Testament came from. It was really coming from the liturgy. I spent a couple of years of my life 
doing a doctorate on the book of Revelation or the Apocalypse. And it's very clear from that last book of the Bible that it was created out of the celebration of the Eucharist. So it's very important. The other good thing about reading the scriptures at Mass is that we're together as a community of faith. We always remember that the Lord called a community of people before he inspired some of them and by the gift of the Holy Spirit to write the word of God. And in fact, it was the church uh, with the early bishops and the popes who decided which books are the word of God and which books are not, guided by the Holy Spirit. So it's important reading of the scriptures at mass. But the trouble is that we read them so quickly and we have one reading and then another reading and then another reading and it's hard to kind of keep them all together. So there's little pieces here and there, but it's the most important way. Sometimes we study the scriptures and we have scripture classes and scripture groups and things like that. And that's important because the word of God was written, came down into this world just as Jesus came 2000 years ago in a distant land and spoke a different language and people dressed differently and so on. And it's good to have a bit of information. So too, the, the word of God became flesh and language um, in, the word, in the scriptures, in the Bible. And so there's some things that require some explanation. Uh, and I'll do a little bit about that, about this passage here. But that's exegesis, it's study of scripture. It has its place, but it's not the most important thing. But what we're doing tonight is really the praying of scripture. This isn't a class on the Bible. This is an experience of prayer. Lexio Divina, divine reading. And from the earliest days, Christians have been doing this. Now, mainly alone, although I do it in a group and I know others have done this this way. And I, what I hope to do by this evening and when people watch this on television is that they will every day do the same thing on their own. Because, you know, a discussion group, you can discuss or a study, you can study, but just praying the scriptures is the most important thing to prepare us for the mass, to prepare us for life. And so what it involves basically is an encounter with Christ. As we hear the word of God, we ask the Holy Spirit to open our hearts to hear God's word. And we ask as the great early writer Origen said that there may be a pathway to our hearts so that God may enter in through the holy word of God. And any barriers we put, our sins, our worries, our cares that can block the word of God, that we say, Lord, free us from that. May there be a pathway to our hearts. Very early times, people would do this. They would read a little bit of scripture. This isn't the whole Bible. This is just a little piece. And usually what I would do is 10 to 15 verses, though tonight it's going to be 20. And it's a, a section of the word of God. First, we start with prayer, asking the Lord to help us to understand and the prayer I always use after the sign of the cross is the one from the book of Samuel. When young Samuel in the temple was heard the word, heard God speaking to him, Samuel, Samuel. And the, uh, the priest Eli, when he went to him, said, I don't know what this is. I hear the word. God, my name is being called. And he said, just say, speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. You know, usually in our prayers, we say, listen, Lord, your servant is speaking. But speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And that's the spirit with which we should always read the word of God. We enter, so there's a little bit of this where we enter into a little prayer. It's like coming off the 401 or the 400. You need a, a, a ramp to kind of for get off the busy road. So let's get off our busy road, get rid of all those cares and things that occupy our hearts and our minds and say, speak Lord, your servant is listening and ask God's mercy. Then there are many, there's no copyright way of doing this. Uh, many suggestions, uh, but the one I follow, and it's based on the tradition, but there are many other ways, uh, just read the whole passage all together, listen to it, and say, what does it say to my head, to my heart, and to my hands? To know, to love, to serve. How does it teach me about the Lord? How does it draw me to deeper love of the Lord? And what does it practically ask me to do? That's a good thing to ask whenever we read the sacred scriptures. Head, heart, and hands. So we read a little, the whole passage. Then I go through and I read the first little chunk. And then I say a few things, I throw them in. And then we have a little silent time, which is the most important thing, to say, what does it say to me? What is this passage? How does it speak to me in my life? Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And then I read another passage, another section, and I say a few words and we have a little silent time. I go through the whole passage that way. 
And then at the end we say, the Our Father, Hail Mary, Glory Be, sign of the cross. There we are, back into life again, back on the other ramp, back onto the busy highway. We don't want to be roadkill on the highway of life. We want to avoid that. We should, you know, do what men are always say they never do, is pull over and look at the map. So anyway, we should do that. And that's what this is, to say, Lord, come to me. I've, uh, I used to, in my former life as a priest preparing seminarians for the priesthood, I used to always hand them out this little book called Beginning to Pray by a Russian Orthodox bishop called Anthony Bloom. He's very good. Big, long beard, deep, piercing eyes. Look very holy. But he had a great, some great stuff in there. And one of them he described in his teenage years when he was an atheist, uh, which people sometimes are in those years and some don't get over it. Um, but anyway, he thought, well, he'd give the church one more chance. And of all things, he picked the Gospel of Mark. He said, it's the shortest. Get it over with, like pulling off the Band-Aid. So he was going to read it from cover to cover. And you can do it in 45 minutes, by the way. You can do it very, very quickly, or maybe, maybe a bit more than that. And as he did it, he felt the presence of Christ. He realized how much the Lord is with him. And that changed his heart. And he became a very, very devoted servant and disciple of the Lord. So that's what Lectio Divina is. It's an encounter with the living God through the instrument of his holy word. Now, what I've been doing in these years, I, I do this from first Sunday of the month usually from uh, September to June. So this is the last one of this year. And then don't do it in July and August. Uh, and so that's 10 months. So I've done Lectio Divina on 10 Psalms, 10 parables, the Sermon on the Mount divided into 10 sections and so on. And I, I don't know what I'm gonna do next year because I've got to think of a 10 something. I'm thinking maybe keeping in mind that Pope Francis's uh, year of mercy, I'm a bit late for it, but. Uh, maybe 10 passages of scripture that speak of the mercy of God that we can meditate upon, pray. I might think of, think of that, or maybe something else. But for the last three years, what I've been doing is we've been, I've di divided, because the Gospel of Mark is relatively short, I've simply broken it up into 30 pieces and 30 sections, 10 each year. And this is the last one. This is the final chapter of the Gospel of Mark. Uh, and uh, so it's finished. This uh, will be finishing the Gospel of Mark. And I recommend the Gospel of Mark, very short, snappy. And the, the Gospel of Matthew is the teachings of the Lord. The Gospel of Luke is that wonderful warmth of the actions of the Lord with other people. The Gospel of John is majestic and beautiful, soars like an eagle. But the Gospel of Mark is short and sweet. This is the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He did this and this and this, very abrupt but it's got that punchy kind of uh, encounter with Christ, which is so beautiful. And so what we have uh, this evening is chapter 16, verses one to 20. Now there's a little complication here, and that is halfway through, you'll see where it says, if we have the text here, and they went out and fled from the tomb for trembling with astonishment had come upon them, and they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid, period. Now that's the place which a lot of manuscripts end. In fact, the two biggest manuscripts stop there. That's it, that's the end of the Gospel of Mark. There's a lot of reasons for thinking that probably is the end of the Gospel of Mark. But some other manuscripts have the rest, verses nine to 20. And some beautiful stuff in there. And we, the, the church in the Council of Trent said, everything in the Vulgate, the Latin text is, we accept it as being the word of God. And that's, these passages are there. So this is kind of an appendix added on, and uh, it, it contains, the author of this is probably not the same as the author of this, but it is the same because the author of both is the Holy Spirit. And so we take that to guide our lives. So let's now start, and uh, enough of me talking about explanations of all this, let's enter into the prayer of Lexio Divina. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let's let go of all those cares and worries and troubles and so many things that clog up our minds, worry us and busy us. Just let them go. And prepare to hear God's word. Let it enter into our hearts. Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening.
let's ask God's mercy for the things within our hearts which block us, pride, anger, envy, greed, laziness, lust, gluttony, all these things that are rocks and boulders that prevent us from listening to other people and to God, that block the pathway to our hearts. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, they went to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they were saying to one another, who will roll back the way the stone for us from the door of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone was rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe. And they were amazed. And he said to them, do not be amazed. You see Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had come upon them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went out and told those who had been with him, as they mourned and wept. But when they heard that he was alive and had was seen, been seen by her, they would not believe it. After this, he appeared in another form to two of them as they were walking into the country. And they went back and told the rest, but they did not believe them. Afterward, he appeared to the eleven themselves as they sat at table. And he upbraided them for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up serpents, if they drink any deadly thing it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God and they went forth and preached everywhere, while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by the signs that attended it. Amen. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. There they were. They had stayed faithful to him. The disciples ran away, but... Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Salome, and of course, Our Lady at the foot of the cross and the beloved disciple, they'd stayed with the Lord. And they came even though he had died and their hearts were sad because they had hoped so much for his victory and he seemed instead to end in defeat. They came to bring that bit of compassion to the one that they had loved, to reach out to the one who had died so violently to bring that love in the form of anointing of the body. They had such care for him. They knew him and loved him. And we might think in our own lives of the people we know who we love very deeply, perhaps are suffering right now, or we think of those who have died. We bring our love to them in many ways, and maybe not in the olden way they had done with these spices to anoint the body. But with our prayers and our our care in our heart, we reach out to other people, especially when they are sick and suffering, and we reach out to pray, to bring the anointing of prayer for those who have died. It's that connectedness. We're never cut off from them. So let's put into our own hearts the spirit of Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, and think of the people in our own life to whom we want to bring perhaps not literally, but in a very deep and profound way, 
those anointing spices, those ways where we can soothe the wounds and bring that expression of love to the ones who have suffered. And very early on the first day of the week, they went to the tomb where the sun had risen. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the door of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone was rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were amazed. They went on their mission of compassion, of mercy, one of the great corporal works and the spiritual works of mercy we have the, to bury the dead. This is a holy thing to do. And they were coming on that act of mercy. It may be good for us to think in this year that our Holy Father has declared the act of mercy, the year of mercy. So they're coming to do that, but they realized they had brought the spices along, they had done what they could, but they realized they were not up to the task that they had forgotten. How could roll back the, the great roll the stone that was blocking the tomb. But then they realize something more, that when we are on these missions of mercy, it's not ourselves that are going to take care of it. We often think it is. We can organize ourselves to make it happen. But they realize, we don't know how to do this. Help! We're not able to do it. I think maybe we need to think about that more as we go about in the life of the church, we can organize and plan and do things. We have a good intention to do this anointing, this help. And then we realize, I don't know how to do it. <laughs> it's not going to work. The task is so great. The stone is too big. And we're forced then not to, to realize we can't rely upon our own ingenuity or whatever. But we find we need to say, here I am, Lord, I come to do your will. Maybe we can simply say, whatever the task is, Lord, roll back the stone, because I don't have the strength to do it. We need one another, and we need the grace of God. And I know in my own vocation, I'm you know, trying to be the bishop of the big diocese, and I keep thinking, how am I going to solve this problem? How am I going to do this? How am I going to do this? And all the problems and cares and things. And I've got to sort of, you know, knock, 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 and sort of, you know, get, what's going on here? This is why it's very good. I always think of the great advice of Bishop Sheen, wonderful bishop. You know, he used to be on television and all that. He was very good um, in the early days, the 1950s and so. And he always urged every priest to spend an hour every day in adoration before our Lord and the Blessed Sacrament. So when he came, so when a priest, and I say this for a lay person as well, when you come to the stone that's too big to roll back, you'll know that you're not the one who's doing it. So let's just ask the Lord to to help us. What is the stone that we got to roll back? What is it? Each one of us is different. We've got our troubles, our cares, maybe in helping another person, maybe doing something good, or maybe it's just in our own life. There's some stone too big to roll back. So let's just, well, give it a push or two. You know, we, we all are asked to do that. But mainly, we're to say, Lord, roll back that stone. Help me in my life. I'm not in charge. I'm not in charge. And that's, I think, especially important for us these days in Canada to think about. I've been involved lately quite a bit with the whole thing about euthanasia. You know that? A sad day in our country. Sad, sad, sad time. And there are many reasons for this thing that's come upon us. Some of it a, a kind of desire to, to help people who are in suffering. And I, I say, yes, indeed, help the suffering, but not by you know, killing them. But another thing, there's another side to it that's not that. It is the sense that, and I just read it today, where, where I read it in one of the papers, a sense that, you know, my life has its meaning, its purpose, its worth, its dignity. When I'm in, I can roll back every stone. You name it, give me a stone, I'll roll it back. I'm a, I can do it. I'm independent. I've got it. I'm in charge. I've made it. There's no stone I can't roll back. And that's what gives me my dignity, my independence. And I would think, no, 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 not at all. Because 
my dignity, my worth comes from my interdependence with other people and with the Lord God. What I am in the sight of God, that I am indeed, no more, no less, and each one of us is precious. And it's not our capacity to function, our stone rolling back abilities, our capacity to function is not what makes us worthy. It is the fact that each one of us is a child of God. And indeed, there are all kinds of people in the world who by some standard someone might pick are not able to function. They're not good at that stone rolling job. But each one of us has a dignity that comes from the gift of God's presence and the fact that we're not independent, we're interdependent. We all need to love and be loved, to depend and to receive, to give and receive. None of us has got it all together. And so when we reach a stage in life, as we do in the earliest stages, when we know we depend on other people, little children depend on other people, or they wouldn't survive the day. And as life goes on, the middle stages of life, we got this illusion that I can roll back any stone. I've got it. I can do it. But not really. We still depend on God and other people. We just don't realize it so much. And as the years go by, believe me, you know, we all know as the years go by, and you realize there's a lot more of my life behind me than ahead of me, and um, all kinds of things. People seem to speak quieter than they used to, and things out there seem to be getting fuzzier. Don't know why. Even the clothing seems to shrink the way it didn't do before. Don't know quite why that's happening, but it seems to. You know, print seems to be getting smaller in books, and I'm realizing I'm depending on all kinds of things. I'm not independent, I'm dependent. And we realize we get further on in life, but that's okay. We're all dependent on other people and on God. We don't master the stones of our life. They're too big to roll away, but that doesn't matter. We still have that dignity. And so we got to think about that in our poor country as people feel sadly that if I can't roll back the stones anymore, what's the point? Might as well, that's it. No, it's not it. It's our inter interdependence that makes us who we are. And so they came and they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb? And looked up, they saw the stone was rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe. And they were amazed. Let us be amazed a bit at what God does in our life and how we can't do it all. And he said to them, do not be amazed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, as he told you. There is the message. The Lord has risen, indeed. Alleluia. They were amazed, and there were greater things to amaze them than simply that the body was not there. They would soon discover him and encounter him. He would say, Mary, and she would say, Rabbi, there, it would happen. There are greater things. The great G.K. Chesterton said that this world is not lacking in wonders, it's lacking in wonder. And we need to be amazed at God's blessings in our lives and not in the little ways we seem to think of it. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee there you will see him as he told you. And he went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had come upon them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Period. That may well be where the Gospel of Mark ends. They were afraid. Oh my. And that's not a very rousing end for a Gospel. But isn't it true? We're all filled with that fear. We know the way the Lord touches our hearts and overcomes that fear. But that fear, it's there. Even in the presence of the wonders of the Lord. So we ask the Lord, help us to be freed of that. It's a very human, very 
frail reality. All of us are pretty frail. And this gospel emphasizes that. But God inspired some sacred writers to add in some more to help us to see the deeper significance of this. But let's reflect a bit upon our fears before we reflect upon the way the Lord lifts them off of us. Each one of us is filled with trembling and astonishment. And all of us are in different ways afraid. And maybe we would be more compassionate on one, with one another if we looked at one another as people who are struggling. None of us has sort of all got it all together. And um, that's good for us to know. That's why that might help us to be more compassionate. Even people who seem to be kind of in command, we're all struggling, every one of us. What a better world it would be if we realized we, we're all struggling with those fears, maybe fear of failure, maybe fear of loneliness, fear of lack of success, fear of whatever, fear of the future, the terror that can come upon us as we look to the future, especially as we approach the moment of death. The Lord himself was sweating blood at that moment. So we need to share that and console that and that's one way of growing in compassion. The other way, of course, is to go to confession. It's kind of hard to be rough on other people when you realize that you're saying, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. We're all sinners and we're all afraid in different ways. So let's be a little, let's cut a little slack for everyone and not be so harsh in what we say or do, especially in the internet. You know, sometimes we write emails and stuff, and you hit the send button. Let's be gentle. There's a sort of hurting puppy out there, and we need to have a little, little recognition of that before we blast away, because we're all pretty frail. And we, may the Lord be kind as he is loving and merciful to us always. May we be loving and merciful to one another. Maybe that's why Pope Francis thought we needed a whole year on mercy, for they were afraid. Let's just think about that for a moment. What does it say to our head, our heart, and our hands? And now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went out and told those who had been with him, and they, as they mourned and wept, but when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they would not believe it. There is Mary Magdalene, who, from whom he cast out seven demons. We have a lot of other things joined to the name of Mary Magdalene, which probably are not. There were several people named Mary in the, in the Gospels. But this is the reference to Mary Magdalene. She is the one who, after all, as we see at the beginning of today's passage, was there to anoint the Lord, to reach out, to be with him to anoint his body. But she don't, we don't know that he had cast out seven demons. Seven means fullness. So there was something deep that he had freed her from. He had freed her, cast out the demons that were afflicting her. He had let her, set her free. And you can see why she would be so grateful. But he appeared first to her. And we, we hear of that. This is where in, in other gospels we hear an actual account of that in the Gospel of John and Luke and others, uh, where we hear where he, you know, she turned and, and she thought he was the gardener. And he appeared to her before he appeared to anyone else. She is sometimes called the apostle of the apostles because she sent the message to the rest of them. My, what a grace. But she went out and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept, but when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they would not believe it. Maybe it was because he had been seen by her. Or maybe it was because he had been seen by her. Maybe they didn't listen to Mary Magdalene because they'd already put her in a box and already sort of categorized her. And they weren't going to listen to what she said. How often do you and I do that to people? 
Maybe it's a time now as we listen to the experience of Mary Magdalene who wasn't believed that we wonder how do we treat other people and perhaps write them off. Maybe she was written off by them. Do we do that to other people? Let's just think about that for a moment and ask God's forgiveness if we do. After this, he appeared in another form to two of them as they were walking into the country. And they went back and told the rest, but they did not believe them. Again, these other two. This is, sounds to me like it's the Gospel of Luke we have a reference to here. The disciples on the road to Emmaus. And we have a beautiful, beautiful account there of how these disciples who were so discouraged that they had hoped so much for Jesus and they were sort of trudging out of Jerusalem. They said, some people have said he's been raised from the dead, but we don't believe it. You know, they're going along. They're going into the dark. As the night falls, they're heading away from Jerusalem. And Jesus doesn't sort of beat a drum and flash a light and blow a trumpet and say, I have risen. That's not the way Jesus usually works with us, is it? Never. He just walks along quietly beside them. They don't even notice he's there until he's walking beside them. And he says, what are you talking about? Oh, haven't you heard about Jesus of Nazareth? Oh, what news? And he, he helps them. He, you know, our faith, we never impose, we always propose. And that's what Jesus does. And as they're going into the darkness, getting deeper and deeper into the darkness, they're walking out into the country, they come to Emmaus, and he says he's going to go on. He doesn't want to insist on his presence. But they say, stay with us, Lord, stay with us. And there they recognize him in the breaking of the bread, which is a sign, obviously, of the Holy Eucharist. He spoke to them on the road, and did not our hearts burn within us as he spoke to us on the road? That's the liturgy of the word, he, the very first liturgy of the word. And then the Eucharist, sign of that. And once they saw that, they turned around. You know, he was with them. He was accompanying them into the darkness because that's where they were going, so he went with them. But he challenged them. He said, oh, you foolish of heart, slow to believe. That's his pastoral style. Foolish of heart. So he chips away at them. And by the time it's over, they're racing back. They've turned 180 degrees they're running back to Jerusalem to spread the word. So we should think about that. First of all, do we notice Jesus walking beside us? Or are we too busy with so many other things? And how do we need to let his voice speak to our hearts? And then we can turn and go in the right direction. But notice also that it's so hard for people to believe. It's hard for each one of us. And we need to ask why. Why is it? What is it in our own hearts that resists the Lord? Maybe it's our own absorption with self. You know, we worship not the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but the unholy trinity of me, myself, and I. And I'll never forget a, a lady once said, you know, when you're all wrapped up in yourself, you make a very small package. And that's very true. And all our worries or our joys, whatever, we don't listen to God or listen to others. May there be a pathway to our hearts so we hear. And afterward, he appeared to the eleven themselves as they sat at table. We know other gospels where we hear of him coming. You remember uh, in John and uh, after the resurrection? And he upbraided them for their unbelief and hardness of heart because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. We hear several people saying he has risen, they don't believe. So he has to come himself and say, hello. And he said to them, but he didn't just, he upbraided them, he shook them up a bit. And that's sometimes what the Lord needs to do to us, you know, he, he gives us a, a little shake to get us going in the right direction. But the point of it all is so that we can move out and share the good news. And this next section is very similar to what we find in the Gospel of Matthew at the end, the Great Commission, it's called. And here is his mission. Go. Remember at the beginning of the Gospel, it's come, come and see. 
come follow me. Come. So we come together first of all. But the last word in Mark and in Matthew is go. We come together to hear, to ask God's forgiveness, to experience an encounter with the Lord. Not so that we can cling to him. Remember he says to Mary Magdalene, don't cling to me. But to go, to spread the word, get out there. That's why our pastoral plan of our archdiocese is care for the gathered, reach out to the scattered. It's right from here. And that's why at Mass, we come together as a congregation, coming together around the table of the Lord, and the Word of God. But we come only to go. Remember the word Eucharist means thank you. Communion means we're all together with one another and above all with the Lord. But the good old-fashioned Catholic name for what we do is the Mass. And that's from the Latin, ite misa est, go, you are sent. And people heard at the end, misa, so they called the whole thing the misa, the mass, the sent, the go. We're to go out there and bring the light of Christ into this world. We don't just hold it in, we share it. So he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation. And he who believes and is baptized will be saved. And he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. These are kind of spectacular signs. And we see them all in the Acts of the Apostles. From the Gospel of, from the second volume of St. Luke. Remember St. Paul is there and he goes, uh, the serpent bites him and we have uh, actually we see in the lives of the saints Saint Benedict was uh, given poison by some monks who didn't like the strictness of his rule he was protected there are sometimes these miraculous things but they always have a point they're not in themselves particularly significant they're always there as a sign of the presence of God and most of the time God comes to us like on the road to Emmaus not with spectacular miracles, but like Jesus slipping up there quietly. But sometimes we need a spectacular thing like St. Paul being blown off his horse and the things mentioned here, but most of the time, it's not the way God operates. For that matter, coming amongst us as a little baby is not the most spectacular thing. So we thank God when we have an experience of his spectacular mercy in miracles and signs and wonders. We hope then that we will understand them. But most of all, we need to be sure we don't miss him when 99% of the time he comes walking beside us as we go into the country. So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirm the message by the signs that attended it. Amen. The signs confirm the message, the sacrament, baptism, and the message, the word. Jesus Christ in word and sacrament. This is the whole thing. And that's something we celebrate in our faith. The word speaks to us, especially the word of God who comes to us, who is basically Jesus. The word is not a book. The word is primarily the Lord Jesus. But we hear the word read out at Mass, the message of the Lord, but we also experience baptism, the sacraments. I just earlier today at the cathedral, I just confirmed a whole group of young people. Confirmation, baptism, the Eucharist, the sacraments, and then the word of God in the midst of it all. What a grace, what a blessing it is. And then it's our message and our mission get out there and spread it to the world. Partly by what we say, but mostly by who we are. And that's why at the, the gospel, we make the sign of the cross on our forehead that we may know these words, on our lips that we may speak them, on our hearts that we may live them. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices 
so they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, they went to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the door of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone was rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe. And they were amazed. And he said to them, do not be amazed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen and he is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples in Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had come upon them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went out and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. But when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they would not believe it. And after this, he appeared in another form to two of them as they were walking into the country. And they went back and told the rest. But they did not believe them. Afterward, he appeared to the eleven themselves as they sat at table, and he upbraided them for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down to the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by the signs that attended it. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.